the deadline for submitting a talk proposal is this Friday, the 30th. Okay. So you have until Friday to come up with an idea for a talk, or a 10 minute talk on anything about the joy, excitement, and surprise of computing. I hope we get lots of talk proposal submissions from you. Yeah. Is it pretty general? Like there is a description? Yeah, anything. Uh, it has the to be only exciting. It has to be exciting, yes. The only constraint <laughs> is there has to be at least one exclamation point in the title of your talk. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. whoa, I forgot the most important thing. If your talk is selected, there's a $256 honorarium that you get. That's real important, yay. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you for asking a question. Or I might not have remembered it. Yeah, so $256, I'm actually going to write that. $256, dude. You talk? There's actual money involved with this. <laughs> so, yeah, if your talk proposal is accepted and you give a talk, then you get $256. Uh, but, but more importantly, you get to talk in front of 200 excited, it's going to be in the engineering auditorium. So you get to talk in front of 200 excited and enthusiastic audience members about the topic of your choice. All right, that's it. Thanks. And I assume that everybody's also welcome to register and attend. Oh, yeah. Conference. Yeah, so registration will open up eventually. Um, in the past, uh, registration is sold out really fast. So the best way to ensure that you get to go is to actually give a talk. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> go for those talks. Thanks, Thank you. Lindsay. Thank you. So, for those of you who are familiar with lightning talks in the sense of never having given one and maybe even never having seen one, what makes a lightning talk? A lightning talk is how short it is. Sometimes a lightning talk is as short as five minutes, but ten minutes is a great amount of time to be. I'm not going to lie, lightning talks are some of the most challenging talks to write. But luckily, they're a little easier to rehearse, because you can rehearse them over and over again in a, in a, in a small chunk of time. Um, but they're some of the, the most thrilling talks to watch. And when I think about lightning talks, I think back to one of my, my first academic conferences that I attended, um, SOSP 2009. In fact, I think I talked about this in this class, and I saw John Osterhaus give his lightning talk on Ram Cloud which at the time was just this idea he had just had and scribbled something on the back of an envelope and it became his major project at Stanford. Uh, under the RamCloud project, the Raft consensus protocol was actually developed to support RamCloud. And John just got up there basically with a, just a, he didn't even have slides, he just had like a piece of white paper and a, and, and, a, and, and a marker. And he was like, yeah, I was just doing some back of the envelope and in a few years, you know, network speeds are gonna be here and memory speeds are here and like, wait a minute, we can look things up across the network at memory speed. Imagine if we had these cheap commodity servers giving us a distributed memory the size of a data center. Well, how fast could it be? Fucking A, it could be really fast. Now we just have to build it. And, and that talk got people excited enough that he got funding to build a lab to just go build that idea he had had like on the plane. Um, and I was like, I want to be like him. I want to learn how to give talks like that. Uh, so yeah, lightning talks are super exciting, super great way to talk about the things you're excited about. Um, so today, let's see. We'll spend a little bit of time recapping because I think it's important in the context of homework for um, uh, the different sort of policies and mechanisms that we looked at for the problem of you know, more abstractly than sharding. It's the problem of sort of data placement. Right? We want to be able to use lots of computers to do things fast, and that thing that we're trying to do fast is a data bound task. Sometimes the best way we can do that is come up with a cunning way to spread that data around the system so that we can process that data in place. Right? Data play. Uh, let's just take a moment and review our strategies. What were some of the strategies that we looked at for placing things, and what was our favorite strategy? Hashing. Hashing was super cool. What do we like about hashing? It's like super fast to do lookups. It's, it's super scalable, right? Because irrespective of how many keys there are in my system, or irrespective of how many nodes keys might be placed on, it takes order of one to run a hash function and figure out where something Constant time operations, right? Scalable operations. Okay. What else do we like or not like? Yeah. Uniformity. Uniformity is super good, yeah. Those are pretty much the main good things. What, what, what didn't we like so much about hashing? We didn't dislike it so much that you're not going to probably do hashing at homework four. You probably are going to do hashing at homework four. But there was a thing we disliked about hashing. Stability. Yeah, what we call stability, right? It really has to do with, like, if there's a change, in the topology, if you change the number of nodes because one of the nodes went away or because you added another node to gain capacity, if we're using classics hashing with mods, we're going to have to kind of move around all the data every time there's a change. Okay? That's a bondage, right? 
right? Because because we're basically we're saying like h of the data item mod d the number of buckets. And so unsurprisingly, this mapping is going to change in a big way if we change it, even by one, right? Uh, so our stability was was not so great. Right? What gave us better stability than hashing? Well, just about anything gave us better stability than hashing, right? If we did round robin and somebody came or moved, we could move some things around. If we randomly placed things, we could move things around. I mean, almost everything did better than hashing. But what did better than hashing without throwing away the benefits of hashing? Consistent hashing. Consistent hashing, okay. So what was it about consistent hashing that worked so good? Or what was the trick? It was this idea, right, of, wait, I didn't hear that. So say that again. The unit circle. So there's a unit circle, that's cool. The unit circle modulo to the k for some big k, right? You can hash the keys and also the servers. Yeah, the kind of trick was that we hashed the data and the servers into the ring. And then we had this neat rule of thumb, which is that if I have some data item here on the ring, this data, data item belongs on the successor node on the ring. Right? And we know we can hash data into the ring, because we can call hash functions on strings and things like that. And we know that we can hash nodes into the ring. Why can we hash nodes into the ring? Well, because nodes have identity, as we've argued before, right? You can just give them numbers because nodes surely have identity because we can send messages to them. And so if nodes have identity and it's a distinct identity, we can hash those distinct identities, place different nodes, or different logical nodes at different places in the unit circle. So you get this world in which there's these nodes. And there's these data items. And the discipline is that the data items all get hashed on their successor on the circle. And that's beautiful because if we remove or add a node to the circle, it only affects the region between that node and its neighbor. Does that make sense? That like, if I had this data item, and it was going to this node, and then I also had other data items that were going to other nodes, and so on and so forth, x, y, blah, 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 we're all going to different nodes, here's n3. If I were to add a new node, N4, the only thing that has to change is that data item D, which was previously belonged on N3, needs to get moved to N4. So in some sense, by, by putting the data and the nodes in the same logical space, uh, we can confine changes to a region of that space. Yeah? So I'm slightly confused. Would this be uniform, just if you redistribute from like the neighbor nodes to this one? Uh, what do you mean neighbor nodes? Well, so by assumption, we have some hash function, H, mm -hmm. which is uniform. Or, you know, damn close to uniform. So in the fullness of time, as we add infinitely many data items and infinitely many nodes, the expectation is that they will all be uniformly placed around them. So, okay. So does that, does that answer your question? No? What's your question? Well, uh, you're adding it like on a location unit circle, right? Is that correct? Uh, it, logically, a data item and a node belong in a particular place on the unit circle. But because a unit circle can't store data, data needs to be stored on nodes. And so the rule of thumb is that data is stored on the rule of thumb, the, the node that is the successor of that data item, the immediate successor of that data item on the circle. So are, are the other nodes moved around on the, on the circle, essentially? Moved around? They are hashed onto the circle. And since the hash function is uniform, the expectation is that nodes, as they come into the system, will be placed roughly uniformly around the circle. Right? And since the nodes are placed uniformly, the data is placed uniformly, the expectation is that every node, as n approaches infinity, has roughly the same amount of data items leading into it between its next node and it. Can you phrase the question differently? What is the question? <clears throat> well, I, I feel like maybe I'm just not understanding something here, but if you have a, a segment of the unit circle, so you have uh, like a circle and you have two nodes on it currently. Okay, like this node and this node, let's say, and forget about the other nodes, okay? Right, and then so, you place, uh, so uh, assume data is distributed among those two uniformly already? Right, so like for example, all of the data items that occur in this arc of the circle all go to N3. And all the data items that occur in this arc of the circle all go to n two. And then that'd be uniform already. So the data items, there'd be a similar amount on each. That's right. We got lucky in this case because n is very small. But in this case, we got lucky. They're roughly equidistantly placed around the circle. What I'm saying is in the fullness of time, I don't care because I expect there to be a great many nodes and a great many data items. And the hash function is uniform. So it's going to roughly smear them e equally around the circle. 
right? But in this scenario, we got lucky, and these two things are have about half a circle on both sides. So the data we would expect, if data was uniformly distributed around the circle, it'll be roughly evenly divided. Oh, right. this, is, this is for a, a high number of n, right? Okay. Yeah, and as n and d increase, or the cardinality of n and d increase, we expect that there's just a great many dots, right? And the expectation is if you take any two things on the line, and then another two things, they should have the same amount of data items between them, roughly, as these things get very big. Yeah? Uh, must there be like a coordinator to direct uh, the hash data towards its corresponding server? Oh, let's, we'll get there, we'll get there. I mean, so this is just a mental exercise, right? We haven't said anything about how to figure out which nodes to actually have which data yet. Okay, so this is just like, this kind of, this is kind of like just saying, hey, I can take a number and hash it and modulo it and it tells me a number, but the number doesn't necessarily tell me how to get to some server, right? Okay, good. So that's consistent hashing. We're going to talk about an application of consistent hashing today. Um, and then we're going to get into all these details about, OK, well, now I want, to, I want to use this as like a distributed hash table. I'm some node who wants to join this network. How do I join the network? Or I want to look up some data on this network, but I don't know the node who has the data. How do I get like routed there? We'll answer, try to answer all those questions today. Um, so, but first, let's, uh, let's have a little history lesson. Back in the early 2000s, when I was a young-ish software engineer, all anybody really cared about and all anybody was publishing about in systems was this thing called peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer systems. And um, although we don't talk as much as we once did about peer-to-peer -peer systems, the subjects of study that were raised back then uh, come up again and again to these pendulums. The current pendulum, what is the hot buzzword besides blockchain? <laughs> that everybody's talking about nowadays. Big data. That feels like roughly like peer to peer. We haven't defined peer to peer. So we should define peer to peer. Decentralized. These are all good words and they all remind me of peer to peer, but there's like one buzzword. That, like if you were going to start a startup and it wasn't blockchain. Artificial, okay, that's good, but that's not that's not what I'm looking for here. Huh? Who said it? Say it. Say it out. IoT. Yeah. So like people talk, people get really worked up about like the Internet of Things, right? What's that? What did the Internet used to be an Internet of? What is that? What is that? The Internet used to be an Internet of Words. You know, so maybe something new is happening here. But as like a crusty old academic, IoT is just a word for what you get when you take peer-to-peer -peer research, which we're going to try to define in a minute, and you mash it up with another hot topic from the early 2000s, this idea of like sensor networks. Like what happens to distributed systems if we start assuming that maybe they're very small, they're very far apart from each other, they have low power and, and, and limited resources in terms of storage and computation, what can you and can you not do? Right, so embedded computing under limited resources, how does that change the, the gameplay for something like distributed systems? And then what happens, and we're going to get this in a minute, when these systems just get massive scale. We're talking about, you're not talking about five computers talking, you're talking about five million computers talking, and they come and go, how do all these things go haywire? If you put together these two things and, and, and simmer, you, you get IoT. Right? You get all of a sudden, you have all these low power devices, you know, your smart fridge or whatever. <laughs> Talking to other smart fridges, figuring out how to pirate music and mine Bitcoin. And stuff like that. So, so from my perspective, IoT is its cool story, bro. But from a research perspective, it's it's very much contained in some stuff that came before. And I want to take a little bit of time talking about uh, what came before. But so, uh, you know, I'm going to give away a little bit of the punchline. But when you think of peer-to-peer -peer systems, if you ever do think of peer-to-peer -peer systems, what do you think of? Like, what characterizes a peer-to-peer -peer system that that, that 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 makes it a sort of a delta? from what we've studied already. So like, peer-to-peer -peer systems obviously are distributed systems. But they're distributed systems with some like constraints or assumptions, maybe pessimistic assumptions about what we get. Well, I mean, with peer-to-peer -peer systems, you have seizures, so kind of people who have, um, I was from my basic understanding, people that seize, say, some, up, they upload data, but then it's cross-checked amongst. I mean, I would say that that's kind of a really kind of BitTorrent specific uh, uh, perspective on peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's also a, a file-sharing perspective on peer-to-peer, -peer, although, to be fair, 
alternate persistence that I'm aware of were developed for the purpose of sharing files. So it's a fair assumption. Although I think like seeding, if I have some kind of protocol that disseminates data, the data needs to come from somewhere. And so the problem of seeding is not exactly unique to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. What is it that makes peer-to-peer -peer unique? Yeah. Um, I want to, or, oh, I guess it's not unique. <laughs> Say it anyway. Or it's, it, there's the notion of, of like pops happening. Or I guess that's what the dynamo, dynamo paper discussed. Yeah, so I'm actually going to write that. I don't think it's maybe fundamental, but it's almost always there. So, so it's very often the case that peer to peer systems implement what's called overlay networks. Right? Where like when we're on the internet, we assume that we're sort of operating on a full mesh or that the, the link connectivity of nodes is abstracted away from us. I can send a message to any other open IP address on the internet. When we have peer-to-peer -peer networks, you almost start to see, you know, imagine you have this link graph where like nodes can see each other, you know, but some not every node can see every other node. And then at layers two, at layer three of the networking stack, people are making decisions to say, okay, if A wants to get to C, maybe there's there's more than one route to C, and we're gonna try to figure out the fast routes to C, so that an application on A can just send a message to C like transparently, right? So then you imagine that there's this full mesh illusion on top of that underlying graph that makes a graph look like literally everybody's connected to everybody, even though that's not, even though that's not true or something like that, right? So this is the illusion provided by routing on top of the actual link graph. <laughs> and then at the application level, it's often the case that it, you know, you want to you want to have control over how things are routed and not have you know ISPs running BGP deciding about how things are routed. So it might be the case that I have this other network that is application level routing. It might be called, it's called an overlay network because it's laid on top of an existing illusion of a full mesh network built on top of an actual neighbor network. Okay. So it is true that when we look at peer-to-peer -peer, uh, protocols for a variety of reasons, the application running peer, the peer-to-peer -peer system wants to have control over how messages get routed through the network. And they want to make those decisions themselves. And so they typically implement an overlay and reason about how many hops away is somebody. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I would say peer to peer systems tend to be ad hoc. So, like, you, you, a new peer arrives in the network and takes part in some processing or computation or whatever, and then maybe disappear immediately, and the system just keeps going. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean here, what I would say here is um, because ad hoc is not a very well defined. I, the term I would choose is that like, we tend to assume that the sorts of networks that we're running peer to peer have high, I don't know why I keep pluralizing everything today, uh, have high churn. That is to say, the expectation is maybe we're running on low power devices or devices that could be open or shut, like a mobile phone or a laptop. So people might come around and be like, hey, I'm willing to, I got this file, that, you know, this Metallica song that I would love to share with you. And then you start downloading, and it's like, oh, psych, I'm down, right? And or people are joining the network really frequently. And so things like I erase or erase stability would appear to be like super important in this world for exactly that reason. So you can, sorry, you had time. Uh, well, I just maybe had something to add, but I'm not sure if it's completely unique to peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, there's kind of the notion of the value of some information shared by peers. For example, some keys might exist only on a few of the, the peers, but some might have like some keys might only exist on one peer. I mean, I, I mean, I guess that maybe that's, I guess that's sometimes true. I don't, and again, I would think that that would be something specific to to peer to peer, right? Any system that's storing things, you can imagine having that system store more copies of the things that we think are more valuable or more likely to be lost. Yeah, I guess, or I don't know if it's appropriate for this conversation, but they're famously uh, dangerous or have like famous like, propensity to be malicious. Okay, I'm just gonna write dangerous because I think it's fun. <laughs> but so like what what is it about them that is so dangerous? <laughs> I mean I think the obvious thing is like there's a fuckload of them, right? So like for like, like if I had some peer to network that had ten thousand machines and I didn't like really lock it down, then it could be your network with ten thousand machines. And you can do all the things that you might want to do with that, like my Bitcoin, for example. <laughs> or do a distributed denial of service attack against Yahoo or something like that. It's hard to make Yahoo down, to bring Yahoo down. But it's easier if you have 100,000 computers all doing the same thing at the same time, doing like a, you know, uh, 
busting its cache, for example, by doing a dictionary, like by looking for aardvark and then antelope and then da 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 and then having like all these clients do this. Uh, I heard somebody out there say decentralized, didn't they? Can I imagine that? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, raise your hand, make sure you get heard. But, but yeah, so that's good, right? So what is decentralized? I would like to take it a step further and say we expect peer-to-peer -peer networks to be like decentralized squared in the, in the sense that they're almost always symmetric. Yeah. Like literally every node plays the same role. And then they're also very often like strictly at the edge. Like everyone plays the same role and everyone is a client. Like if this is the internet, the peer-to-peer -peer network consists of these nodes hanging out over the edges with very little participation from the core, right? So it's sort of, it's symmetric. Everybody's just a C. So C's have to do everything, right? There's no directory. There's no decider, right? And then, and then they tend to be on the edge, too, with very little support from you know, the backbone of the internet, yeah. Uh, so I think that that's most, oh, then there's one really important thing that we haven't said yet. So just like massive scale. I mean, I already said it, right? Which is that like, we're talking about a distributed program that involves the cooperation of 10,000 computers or 100,000 computers, like as opposed to literally every other distributed program that we studied in this class, which has involved three or possibly five or seven computers, right? So it's a great many computers. You combine a great many computers with a high degree of uh, dynamism yeah, it gets pretty hard to, pretty hard to program these things. Does that all make sense? Peer-to-peer -peer systems. Is there anything I'm missing from peer-to-peer -peer systems? So, what was the first commercial peer-to-peer -peer system? Like, you know, 
Usually database licenses come by the number of cores or the size of the servers, it can cost a lot of money. Um, uh, you would have to have a really, really big pipe, right, to be able to support streaming this, the, these, these songs, which in those days were big, that's like big data. In those days, like MP3, Jesus, it took like 10 minutes to download that shit. You know? Like, it would never work uh, if we had to share this pipe, right? This is a really thin pipe. So what would be a better approach that maps could do? What's that? Target the client's router and then have their own database system? Well, yeah, absolutely. So the clients, in some sense, already have their own database, right? Because I have no intention of giving craps through my MP3s and then not having them myself. Right? So sort of everybody already has their, their music library. Um, the problem is, is that I don't know who has the song that so client four wants a song that client two has. So we can take this design and just say, well, why don't we just, why don't we just um, have the database just handle the management? Hand? Oh, shit, that reminds me. Um, uh, on Monday, December 3rd, we had a guest speaker for the class. Uh, his name is Pat Helen. He's like a really important person in the history of of databases. He worked with Jim Gray at, at Panem, nonstop, one of the earliest database companies. And he, uh, he worked at Amazon and, gosh, Microsoft. And now he's at Salesforce. And the reason I thought about this is because he just did some really big thing at Salesforce where he took their Oracle databases that used to have all of the data and came up with a system where the data is now stored in this eventually consistent, massively distributed Hadoop file system. And just the metadata is in the Oracle database because it's the metadata that needs to be kept transactionally consistent via serializability and not all the actual data, which just needs to be replicated in order to survive faults and immutable so that it stays uh, consistent. So this idea of saying you have a database and you can kind of factor the database into a database of just metadata and a bunch of pointers to immutable data is a very nice system design pattern that I hope Pat will actually talk about. Uh, so, so don't miss it. He's just the most amazing dynamic speaker you'll ever meet. So it's going to be really fun. So anyway, that's the idea. It's like, we can still have a directory. And now the role, now it's not Napster anymore, it's Napster. And the idea is that the role of Napster is basically being an index, knowing who has what file, and then ultimately playing the role of the matchmaker. So client four connects to Napster. But meanwhile, client one, who's been streaming music, is also connected to Napster. And so is client two. And so when client four asks for seek and destroy, Napster can say, oh, Client two has it, and client four can directly connect to client two and download it. Right? So Napster has gotten out of the critical path for pushing bits and bytes across the network. Napster is just there to set up rendezvous between clients. Right now, C3 connects. They want some file that's over on C1. They connect directly to C1 and download that file. Everything works great. Right? It was great, and it's worked for years. I use this for years. Um, actually, it didn't work great. What went wrong with that? What's wrong with that? What happens when clients die? Well, you know, the thing is, in the fullness of time, maybe it doesn't matter. Because, like, if this was a really obscure song that nobody cared about, somebody might listen to it one time and not give a rat's ass. But if it was a Metallica song, then probably client three would put it in her music library. And now we have replication for free on behalf of these clients, of whom there are sort of arbitrarily many. And it just kind of works. Because you imagine that popularity of the song is likely to have what kind of distribution? A long tail power law distribution, right? There's some songs that are just so popular, right? And then there's some songs that like literally only one person in the world has ever listened to. <laughs> and so just any kind of caching strategy is gonna do pretty damn good. Like these, all these ones in the fat part of the, of the curve are very likely to be in many, on many people's laptops, right? And that's like really fair. Which means if you're into like obscure indie music, Time. Right? It only worked when that one dude was online. <laughs> um, anyway, so why didn't this work? This didn't work, by the way. Now it's not right. Yeah. Is it really delicious? Like you could rename a file or something? So it is easy. You know, the thing when I teach this, this is all, almost always the first thing that comes up. I don't know what's wrong. Like it is easy to be malicious. Um, and it's certainly easy to like say something's Metallica and have it be like, on the other hand, this is sort of, this is all in the game for illegally sharing files. Right? If you like, if you share stuff with randos, you might get something. Right? So I think like that's a fundamental issue that could have made it harder. But I wouldn't argue that it's actually a problem with this architecture for dissemination. 
right? You should be careful when you share illegal things. Somebody might have done something to it, right? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, hash and collisions, like, you know how to handle hash and collisions in practice, right? It's just a matter of engineering. Put a, put a link list on there. Why, why do you think Napster isn't around anymore? That's true, but I, I guess I didn't understand your concern about not being able to control the number of copies. Maybe this is going to take the conversation to a really philosophical place. But I think that like when you have something like software or music, where there's essentially no cost to fabricate new copies of it, it's not necessarily clear whether it matters how many copies you have. And this is like a fundamental argument of like new and open source. It made sense to sell things when there was like a non-trivial fabrication cost of the thing. But when there isn't, what it means to be a thing and what it means to duplicate a thing get philosophically tricky. So as a philosophical matter, I'm not convinced that it matters to anybody how many copies there might be. No, obviously it matters to Metallica, which I guess gets down to the, <laughs> so I guess gets down to the really important matter, which is that Metallica got pissed off. They weren't the only ones. And all they had to do was send a team of lawyers to the building where this database was. And that was the end of that. Right? Because this thing was being used to do illegal things, whether or not it was like supposed to be used to do it. And it wasn't remotely decentralized or symmetric or edge. Right? When there's just one you know, directory, somebody can just pull a plug on the directory. So it could be a DDoS, or it could be the RAA, but this was never going to work. Because this wasn't really a peer to peer system in the first place, right? Or in some ways, it was a hybrid system, right? It had a peer to peer phase, but the peer to peer goodness didn't start happening until after the rendezvous was set up by that same point of failure. So it's tempting to ask can we get something that looked like the bottom half of this without the top half? Pyrofake puts its metadata in a torrent. Pyrofake puts its metadata in a torrent. Yeah, so the metadata of all the torrents is a torrent that you can download. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, sure. Um, somebody has to seed those torrents, but people can come and go and seed those torrents, right? There's no like, single torrent. Although you do expose yourself to risk by doing so, right? But let's not, let's not get the torrents yet. Let's go historically. So that was an abstract. It didn't work. It didn't work because it was too easy to shut down as soon as somebody got upset. So people still wanted very badly to share music illegally. So they, they put on their thinking caps. And this is when like, the peer to peer thing really started happening. So, anybody know what the like, next big way to pirate Metallica songs was? Yeah. Light wire? No, you're going too fast. <laughs> but I will say that LimeWire used protocol, and so did uh, Kazaa, and so did uh, Morpheus, and um, I forget what else, but there's a protocol that predated all these things, it was sort of an answer to the problem of Napster. Anybody happen to know this obscure piece of trivia? Yeah. Nutella? Very good. What? Oh. Nutella. What? Oh. You remember what? Nutella? <laughs> Can I share a fact? Sure. Yes, please. So, you've heard of Nutella, the hazelnut spread. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a teenager, I was such a nerd that I was, that I was aware of Nutella. <laughs> without being well aware of Nutella, and I thought that Nutella, the spread, was ripping on the Nutella. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you can use that 
right? Open source people mm -hmm. right, came up with this because they because they thought that uh, that thing I was just saying a moment ago that files like software are just a bunch of bits and it doesn't cost or hurt anybody to copy them and share them freely. So let's write some software that makes it easier for people to copy and share freely these things. I'm just curious, in peer-to-peer -peer systems, are there systems that try to deter people from defecting or making it expensive to defect? What do you mean by defect? Um, I guess um, the, someone brought up that you could be malicious and you know you can personally, like individually, be conscientious and only download you know, uh, copies of data that you want. Um, in a system where, I guess defect is a very loaded term, but I, like, I'm wondering that if somebody wanted to you know, sabotage the system, Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's by no means my area, and I end up being like having a hole in my brain when it comes to this sort of stuff, like security. I'm not very good at reasoning about this kind of game theoretic stuff, but these sorts of concerns come up not just in peer to peer systems, although obviously they're really important in peer to peer systems where we can make very, very shallow, if any, assumptions about the identities of the other players and their intent, right? Like in a data center, I can make some assumptions about the code that's running on the servers and things like that. But this is also an issue in any kind of open system. Like if you were to get a networking class, this comes up all the time like with TCP, right? Because a, a protocol like TCP, you're supposed to negotiate between the sender and the receiver how much bandwidth you think there is between you and the and you, between the two of you in the network, so that you can utilize the bandwidth without using too much bandwidth and making it bad for everybody else, right? So you need the TCP to play well with everybody. But I can just hack my TCP and ignore these hints in order to get me more bandwidth, and this is like the tragedy of the commons. You heard the phrase of tragedy, it was a tragedy of the commons because the commons is the, is the land. Um, so similarly in peer-to-peer -peer systems, there's all sorts of work, and then especially in the Bitcoin community, for how do you like incentivize good behavior, right? And very often the answer looks like you want to make it advantageous to be good, right? So BitTorrent did a lot of interesting things like this where like how fast you're allowed to download is in part determined by how good a citizen in terms of providing upload bandwidth and what path flow, right? And so it's one of those things where that's pretty hard to gain, right? It's like being hurt, you know, doing a mitzvah is its own reward or whatever. You try to create a system where that is true, where it, you get the rewards for just being a good citizen. Um, it's easier said than done, right? And I think it like requires a little bit of game theory that I don't really have in that form. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, absolutely these things come in. I think defecting would be something that would be would be very specific to a particular bad behavior that you thought that, you know, might be happening. Okay, so where was it? So, Nutella. So, how do you think Nutella improved upon Napster? Well, needless to say, there can't be a central directory at this point. But we still need to be able to look up files. Yeah. I wonder if it, like, talks from peer to peer, checking their, what songs they have, yeah. and then return. Yeah, them. sure. So, let, let's start there. So, like, Let's start by saying, well, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system, and I've sort of already tautologically defined that, is that these things have to be decentralized. So a Nutella network is a collection of nodes that are all running the same song. Um, so in order to determine, for, for, so what are some of the questions you need to ask for a peer-to-peer -peer network that's storing data? Well, one obvious thing is, how do you search for data? We'll get there in a minute. But then there's the other questions about, like, how does a node join the network? How does it become one of the nodes in the Nutella network? And you know, how do nodes leave the network? Maybe we can get away with just answering those questions for right now. Right? So these these nodes, you know, so like first let's 